Are you ready to manage your work and personal world better to live a fulfilling, productive life? Then you've come to the right place. Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things productivity. Here are your hosts, Ray Sidney Smith and Augusto Pinaud, with Francis Wade and Art Gelwix. Welcome back, everybody, to Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things personal productivity. I'm Ray Sidney Smith. I'm Augusto Pinaud. I'm Francis Wade. And I'm Art Gelwix. Welcome, gentlemen, and welcome to our listeners. Today, we are going to pick up from our conversation last week, where we were talking about cybersecurity practices for personal productivity enthusiasts. And where we left off last week was we were talking about some cybersecurity practices that we all can use in our own personal productivity systems. And so we're going to pick up the conversation there. And then we're going to end with talking about some of the privacy and security tools that we may use or may suggest to others uh, to help them be more cyber resilient in this digital age. We've talked about it a little bit with the different tools that you can have. And we, from what I gather, we all use different password management tools and cybersecurity tools and things like that. But it goes back to the most basic thing you can do, which is having good passwords, uh, not easily guessed, not using personal data in them, um, also not reproducing passwords across multiple systems. It's too easy nowadays to have so many passwords that you kind of fall back to that default mindset of, okay, I'm going to use some kind of variant of this on all my systems so I can remember it. Well, that's just asking for trouble. And you have to, you have to determine what is the safest thing to do? Is it, is it worth putting the effort in to creating unique passwords, to storing unique passwords and tracking unique passwords with the understanding that you are in a more secure situation then, or are you willing to give up that security for the convenience? And I think a lot of people fall into that second camp and unfortunately wind up paying for that through honestly no fault of their own aside from not taking that extra step. So I would say regardless of what tools we talk about, what solutions we put in place, um, anything over the next hour or so, start with the most important thing, which is use good password etiquette. This can't be underscored more. I mean, it's so, so important for people to recognize how much the duplication of passwords creates a an increased attack surface um, on the internet. I mean, if every time one account gets hacked and you've reused that password, it just creates this multiplier effect because those hackers know, those bad actors know, I don't like to use the term hackers, those bad actors, those people who are basically cyber criminals, they know uh, that if someone's password gets cracked in one place, they can use it in other places, and so they're going to test. So duplicating passwords is I absolutely art. You're right on point. And you need to understand where you are regarding cybersecurity. You know? There is people who understand it. There is people who don't understand it. And there is people who don't want to even try to understand it. So regarding which camp you are, you just need to understand this is something really important and put yourself in the right campground. I use a password, been using it for a long time, called 1Password. And 1Password, one of the things it does is create the passwords. I can tell them what kind of formula do I want, and they will create a password. But also review that I don't have repeated ones and review if anything happened on these sites, it will give me a warning, hey, this website was compromised you know, go and change it. And I think services like that, and, and one password is one, last pass is another one. There are many of them. But with the importance of cybersecurity, it's fine that you don't understand the intrications of this. It's fine that you don't understand how to be a cybersecurity expert, but at least find the tools that will put you in a better position. At the end of the day, these criminals will look the low-hanging fruit first. So try not to be the first. You know, we, we used to joke when we were kids, you know, we, we sit in camping, we sit next to the slowest runner. So that way, when the bear comes, you get to the slower runner. Well, it's not different with the cybersecurity. You know, try to be next to that person and try to understand where is your family regarding this? Because one of the things I found sometimes, I found people who use these products, but then 
when you see their immediate family, their parents, their wife, their kids, okay, they use no password. Well, if your password is really secure, but nobody else is, you are still vulnerable. I'm a little suspicious of of the one of the flavor of the day kind of um, recommendation that says here's the here's the app you should use today. Um, and I say suspicious, not not in the bad way, but is, is there a way I'm wondering to operationalize the the hardening of your security so that you're like Augusto said, you're always one step ahead. What's the what's the what's the ongoing process someone needs to engage in to a um, always be one step ahead and b um, choose a choose a, a way of managing their passwords that's uh, compatible with their habits because you, you know you don't want to pick up some something that's so safe and so outside your way of operating that you either can't use it or never use it. But I'm wondering about how do you operationalize those two? Well, there's there's a catch-22 with it because first is making the assumption that you'll ever be able to get one step ahead. Um, unfortunately, we will always be operating one step behind what's going on out there. So we, we have to take it from the standpoint of, I just need to do the things as much as I can do reasonably. So if you take it to like the physical space. Are you locking your house doors? Are you locking your car up? Are the windows closed? Those kinds of things. Because there's only, if somebody really wants to get into your stuff, they will find a way to do it. That said, backing off of that, um, operationalizing the process of say rotating passwords and, and updating and things like that. It's an excellent principle. It used to be much easier when we had so fewer passwords. But when you think now about all the passwords you have, not just, we think about passwords, we think about email and things like that, but think about every subscription service you're on. Think about every online shopping system you're on. Think about every newsletter you've sent for that they ask you to sign up for. Uh, Anything that has an account has a password attached to it. So you wind up with where we had four or five, now we've got four or 500. That's where some of these tools do come in handy. Uh, the one that I use will actually go through and check all the passwords that you've stored in it and say, "Is this has this password been around too long? Is this password too simple? Is it too close to another one you've used? And give you that assessment back. You can rely on the tools to do that. I rely on the tool to do it just because I don't feel like putting the effort out to do it manually. But you could do it manually. You could keep track of on this system, this is the password that I used, and this is the last time I changed it. And set yourself reminders, for example, within your productivity system so that you know to go through and update your passwords. My only caution with that, and I always try to look at both sides, if you operationalize it too much and you turn it into a habit, you have the likelihood if you don't include in the process the creation of randomized passwords, the likelihood of creating passwords that are sequentialized. So, and that's not even a word, I just made that up, that are sequential. So you could say ABC1 next month. Yeah, okay, I need a new password. I'll just use ABC2. I'm sorry, somebody's going to guess that. They're going to try that first. So while I agree with the operationalization of your security, you have to look at it. What can I do from a system or a systemic standpoint to simplify that to mean that I'll actually do it? Okay, that that seems that there's two levels. Then there's a level of how do what, how do I operationalize the management of my password so that it's bearable, and 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 the standard may be what Augusto suggested, which is not that you stay ahead of the hackers, but you stay ahead of the least secure person around. So there may, someone should perhaps come up with a a measure, a metric that tells you if I use this approach, then I'm ahead of 95% of the people out there, which means that I'm not the lowest hanging fruit. It's a lowest hanging fruit measure. And maybe there's a way to diagnose your current habits and say, okay, I'm at the 96th percentile, I'm okay. And as long as I stay at the 96th percentile, I should be I should be all right because the, the, the everyone below that level is likely to be hacked and I'm not. They, w- they won't get to me in, in when they do their hacking. 
that's the one level. But then the next level I think you're talking about, which is how do you renew the system that you're using on a regular basis? Uh, how do you review it? So, for example, if somebody comes out and says they figured out a way to hack LastPass, okay, the, the news would drive, hopefully, all LastPass users to now look for an upgrade. Or if there were some vulnerability that were detected, then they would have to go looking for the next thing. Um, but ideally, they should be looking for the next thing before that hacker gets into, gets into LastPass for the first time. They should know, in other words, how do I, what's my next improvement? I may not implement it, but I'll at least know what the next improvement is. So that when, if and when LastPass does get hacked, then I'm already ahead of the game. I already know what my next step is. So it's a, there's two levels of this that I'm wondering about. Well, think, think about it, though. There's, there's actually another, <laughs> there's two levels to the second level of what you just talked about. Um, if you think about cloud-based systems, yes. The possibility is there that they will get hacked because, you know, it's like robbing a bank. Why do you rob a bank? That's where the money is. But the second part of that question is, what can they get access to even if they get in? And I'll go, uh, most of the cloud-based systems, LastPass included, Microsoft's personal vault, the contents are encrypted as well as the passwords to get in. So even if they get in, they can't get into anything that's in there. So it's that secondary level that you have to look at and say, like, for example, OneDrive, which is an application I use all the time. OneDrive has a password to get into my account. Once, there, once you're in my account, there is a thing in OneDrive called the personal vault that you can set up. That is an encrypted secondary vault that requires different authentications to get into. So even though you can get into the top level of my account and see everything in my OneDrive, you can't see what's in that personal vault. Microsoft can't see what's in that vault because they don't have the encryption keys. Only I do. So you, again, you have to think about now we're talking about multiple tiers of security. We've locked the front door. Now we've locked, locked the gate getting into the vault. Now we have a vault that has a combination lock on it. Are we going to put a lockbox inside the combination or inside the vault to protect stuff that much more? And it's it's the layers. I mean, if we think about Shrek, it's layers of an onion. Well, security is like an onion. And the more layers you can have, the more protected you are. So the only thing that I'll say in addition is, is a little bit of umbrage with the idea that you can only stay ahead of the next least secure person. And the reality is, is that there are tools out there today that allow you to be able to very quickly search all of the various types of technology that might be culpable to an attack. And with that kind of power in cyber criminals' hands, you can't presume that you are just a little bit faster than the next guy that's going to be eaten by the bear in Augusto's analogy. Uh, so that works on some level, but it doesn't quite work on, on the rest of this, which is that now we are at a point of computing where because of cloud computing, we have the power to be able to very quickly disseminate uh, large scale attacks. And that means no one is safe when they're not doing the right practices. So in the password example here, I think you're all kind of touching on the same uh, right points. And it's important to remember that these kind of password tricks that people always talk about, you know, oh, you know, write a sentence and add a number and a letter, you know, at the end or beginning or the name of your social network at the end of it, those kinds of things. It really has very little to do with the the tricks that we use, the mnemonics we use for being able to remember passwords. Uh, we should have long randomized passwords. And the longer the password, the, the more computing power it takes for that bad actor, that, that malware person to go ahead and crack into that account. Now, that also depends on the strength of the service you're using. So, you know, if, if one particular server is using a very uh, short password field, uh, which continually irritates me, <laughs> um, you need to go to those providers and say, why are you only enforcing a 12 character password field? Like, we're in 2020 or 2021, you know, what's the what's the deal with having such a short password field? So we have to take somewhat of a of an a 
uh, more active approach in the platforms that we're using and the security of the platforms we're using when we're talking about web-connected services or web-based services. As soon as you find yourself in a position where you can't create a you know 60 character length password, you're you're putting yourself at greater risk by using that service, right? So I'm not saying disconnect from the internet and don't use anything ever again on the internet, but just do recognize that a lot of the security is out of your hands when it is web connected or web based, and you can do certain practices, all of the ones that you know Art has noted already. But don't think that you don't have to go out and talk to those services and say, your cybersecurity practices are rubbish and you need to fix it. And it's only through this active approach, poking the bear, is, it, you know, we're not going to get greater and better services. And every time I come across a service where, you know, I type in my, my, my password manager pops up, I select, you know, 60, 70 character length password, and then it gives me the error that the password wasn't accepted because it was too long, you know, my blood boils and I immediately write to them and say, I'm not using your service until you can properly protect me. And I will tell everyone I know not to use your service until you can properly protect me. And that's part of the, that's kind of part of the, the, the social contract right now between developers and users. And we need to be able to strengthen that social contract that they need to be not just functionality focused, they need to be security focused as they're developing tools for us in the personal productivity space. We need to teach the people inside. We need to also enforce that agreement to the services and the companies that that we deal and that we work. Uh, you know, most people will not leave the door of their house open and they don't understand that the lack of passwords is no different than having the door of the house open. It is with with all this schooling and homeschooling and things that are happening. It's been really interesting for me to see how little people understand that transformation or that transition between the physical world and the digital world. Uh, so we've seen the school of our kids go, you know, struggle with this transition and trying to turn their so many years of experience teaching kids on physical level to now go to this virtual world. It makes you think about how can you maybe teach people the importance of these passwords when you come to the digital world in the same way and, and make you understand. I've been using password handlers for uh, Splash ID was the first one I think I used and I uh, it was on the Palm Pilot and and I understood the importance of it and I've been fighting with the people surrounding me on the importance of it. But what I did not realize was it's not that people, it may be that people don't want to be not secure. It's not that, it's just that they don't understand the transition between or, or how to translate that from the physical world, the world they live and they understand to this digital world that they can, they, they, they cannot grasp. Plus, they might be a little bit numb to it, right? You know, the reality is, is that after, after so much has been talked about and, and bandied about the, Equifax hack and all of these, you know, Target was hacked and, you know, everybody's hacked. Everybody feels like, oh, well, you know, these companies have already been hacked. So why should I even try? Uh, the reality is, is that we can't take that kind of lay down and, and die kind of perspective. We need to really stay active and stay uh, kind of forward thinking about how we're going to protect ourselves going forward into the future. You know, what happened has happened. We can We can clean up the mess of anything that large companies create for us. But the greater we kind of armor up and have these proactive practices, we are able to be more resilient against future problems. And it's just, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And this also kind of reminds me of the issues around real data privacy issues around social media and how a lot of people give away a lot of information about themselves. Uh, for example, their, where, their whereabouts in 
particular time frames. And so, you know, it's really important that if you're going to be away from home for an extended period of time, that's not the time for you to go onto social media and telling the world. Uh, you know, that's going to be a clue to a physical criminal, uh, you know, to a burglar to know that you're not going to be home and then to go ahead and burglarize your home. We do these kinds of things in our own uh, personal worlds, and we do them in our professional worlds all the time. And they are subtle types of data. They may be ambient types of data now because of web-connected devices and web-based services. You know, we're posting information about ourselves that tell our whereabouts at all given times of the day. And because of that, then that's cluing in uh, cyber criminals as to know when to go after devices. You know, if, you, if, they're, if they want to hack you, they're going to hack in to your computer when you're logged in and not present at your computer versus when you are logged in and present at your computer because then they can do things on screen that you won't notice. Uh, you know, it's it's things like that that you have to be a little bit more conscious of as we uh, go into this new era. You can't really let yourself, let your guard down. And it's not to be manic or panicked. It's about just making sure that you're doing the right practices. Uh, and one of the, like the most important thing you can do is update your software. Make sure that your software is up to date on all of your devices. And you don't have to be on the latest version of everything. What it just means is that the at least the first, the, the, the most recent two to three updates need to be on your system so that the, the vast majority of the types of hacks that happen are happening because there are cyber criminals out there who are paying attention to exploits that have been identified, you know, basically uh, bugs in, in software that allow them to be able to, to utilize um, them as entry points into systems. And then they go, go around and start, you know, poking at different systems to see which ones are available. If your system has gotten the update, then it won't be susceptible to it. If your system is uh, not up to date, then it will be susceptible to it. So just getting those kinds of updates done are useful. And I think one of the most important things you can do in terms of staying uh, protected. Moving right along in terms of unprotected things, I just wanted to make a note here for everyone that email is not secure. So let me, uh, it, it just bears repeating, email is not secure. It is an open protocol. And while we can understand we can secure different parts of email, Email by its very nature is not secure. And we can make it more secure with things like PGP and other kinds of encryption technologies. But again, email is not secure. So if you are attempting to uh, argue with me over the idea of sending uh, email or sending messages in a secure environment, and then you send me send me your you know, user account credentials via email, you you that that is not secure. It is absolutely not secure. I mean, the, the only thing less secure is probably fax. Uh, <laughs> um, so anything sent over the copper wires that are unencrypted, uh, really just understand that email isn't secure. And I can't say it enough and, 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 and say it loud enough to people so that they stop having this false sense of security around email. If you do want to send some kind of secure messaging, then I recommend using tools like Signal or Telegram or Threema. Threema has two E's. And those tools allow you to securely message if you turn on either the, in the Telegram case, secret chat, but Signal and Threema are both end-to-end -end encrypted, E to E, E, and allow you to be able to send secure messages. And because the vast majority of communication today is just messaging back and forth and maybe lightweight document sharing, use a messaging app that's going to make you far more secure. It's on all of your devices, just like email, and gives you the ability to be able to do that. Email has its place. Email is an important um, platform. But don't think that you're going to get email uh, in a secure fashion uh, without doing a lot more work than we currently do it. See, Ray, and I'm... Okay, I, I want to pile on that real quick, though. Text messaging is also not secure. SMS. Amen. Do not... Con do not confuse the fact that email, okay, that's not secure, so I'll use text messaging because that's not secure either. And so many businesses now use that as the way to send you authentication codes and password validations and everything else. That's no better, if not even worse in many cases. So I just kind of wanted to put that out there. Phone numbers can be spoofed and you can send messages from almost any phone number and receive those numbers, those messages by by any number. So yeah, you're absolutely right, Art. You cannot depend upon SMS uh, as, a, as a secure messaging function. 
have an operational question. I'm very operational today, apparently. Go for it. Go for it. Which it's 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 a simple one. So I use I'm a heavy WhatsApp user because here in the Caribbean that's the that's the default. No one uses Telegram, Threema, Signal. Or, not for long. Well, not in the foreseeable future. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I I I was just actually reading a Forbes article yesterday about the fact that Signal is now getting to that point where it's becoming more uh, more useful and more user friendly. That it will potentially challenge WhatsApp, uh, and you know, also free and and you know, widely available. So um, yeah. Anyway, get get to your question, and then we can go from <laughs> sure, there. Sure, why not? <laughs> it's a it's an easy question, which is so I have I have. I have you guys on Telegram. You're the only users I know of Telegram who I'm in communication with. I have the rest of the world on WhatsApp. But how do I send a secure communication with someone I don't I, with on a system that I don't want to download just to send them a message? So if they're using Signal or they're using Threema, I don't want to have to download those messages, those messenger services. Just I don't have any space on my phone anyway, but I don't want to do it just to send them. Uh, a, a series of messages over, say, three days or something like that. Is there a is there a service that allows you to send a secure message over a short period of time, like or one time message, or over three days, for example? It doesn't require you to have to download an app and have to da 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 da, da, da become a user and all this stuff. Is there an, a, a solution like that? So the thing that comes to mind immediately is that you can just use the web versions of many of these tools, like. Say, for example, you were not a WhatsApp user, you can just use WhatsApp on the web and then shut down the account and delete it. Um, but there's no, I mean, there's no system that I've looked at that I would be comfortable with saying, oh, yes, you can you can use this temporary tool. I mean, all of these companies, their their business model depends upon you using them in the long term. It would be a, a huge problem. I mean, it would, be, it would be akin to the idea of what we have with these email, uh, pro, you know, these burner emails and burner phone numbers. If something is not identifying you and being tied or being bound to you in some sticky way, then it then it's rife for criminals to be able to utilize them, right? So this is the this is the rub, right? This is the convenience over security issue. You want the convenience of not having to be able to set up an account, verify that it's you who's actually using that account, which really that whole situation needs to be cleaned up by itself. I mean, there's no question that uh, verification of identity is a is a poor practice globally. But beyond that, right? Uh, the the notion of then uh, say having a system where I can just send a lightweight message to someone else and then have no uh, footprint of me having sent that message. Uh, that's the stuff of espionage, right? That's the that's the stuff that uh, you know state uh, you know uh, uh, state authorities are looking for in um, monitoring criminal activity. So they're much more likely to gain access to those types of platforms and to break those uh, encryptions uh, for purposes of finding out why you're trying to send such a secret message. So I would actually much rather you uh, tell that person, you know, go to web.telegram.org create an account and send me that message. And then you can delete the account when you're done, uh, turn on, you know, secret chat, whatever it might be on the mobile device. All those things are probably easier than utilizing a tool where ultimately the ephemeral technology is going to create greater heartache for you in the future. Yeah. So it's an operational problem because the average person is, is going to have a hard time with that, with that, um, with that approach that every time I need to send a message, I need to download an app, upload, create an account that I don't want, and then I got to send the five digits that I need to send. And then I got it's it's you know it's a half it's a twenty minute half an hour of activity to send four letters. That's why people go just send email, you know, because the convenience of the one versus the other is. And I think lots of these lots of these security um, solutions aren't really built around the sort of the thought, how can we make this easy for the user to be secure? I guess that, that, that the easier you make it, the less secure you have to make it. But I guess that's the, the, the paradox. That That's the challenge you get into. That's where you get into things like using two-factor authentication to identify and pick things up. 
Um, so, you know, you send a message through and then it sends a confirmation through to your phone. You say, yeah, that's me. And then all of a sudden the application opens and loads, but it still requires applications to do that. You need technology and you need software to simplify the process because it's, you're asking it to do the thinking for you rather than you going into your email client, assigning a PGP key, encrypting your email, sending it out. You're asking the software, do all that thinking for me so that my life is easy, but things are secure. And it's a give and take. You're going to have to say, am I going to do one or the other? Where I question some of it and comes back to this model of availability, how often do we need to send one-off highly secure messages to people that we don't already have uh, contextual or, or, or systemic relationships with? I don't think it happens very often. I mean, it does. You, you might have like with financial institutions and things like that. But even in those case, cases, they want you to go through the applications they have. If you're doing like a student loan or a mortgage or something like that, they allow you to upload content. Well, that upload's done through, hopefully, if you're using a good institution, an encrypted data channel through their applications so that it, your information is protected as they receive it. There's nothing that says what happens to it once it gets inside their walls. But as it's traveling across the wires, it has that isolated tunnel that's used to transfer the data. But that, again, is up to the applications at either end to establish that tunnel. So I don't know that you're ever going to find some easy one-off, yeah, I'm going to do this and it goes away after that. There may be some. I, I absolutely think that there are probably out there. I don't know that they're at the level of like a Gmail or a Messenger or a WhatsApp type of usability, though. They're a very small, you probably find them in the open source community because that seems to be a, a bit more secure because you're looking at being able to look at the encryption code. You're able to look and make sure that there aren't any bad actors building stuff into that. But I still don't think you're going to get to that point of just having some simplified process. Security requires commitment. You have to be willing to put the effort out to have the peace of mind. And if you're not willing to put that effort out, you're going to get kind of what you pay for. When we get to the tools, we can talk about some ways you can do that, Francis, if it's just a one-time code with someone you don't know. And, and there, there, there may be a, a tool that that solves for. Um, but we'll talk about that when we, when we get to kind of talking about, about tools. I want to, I want to focus in on, uh, in terms of the conversation, anything else we wanted to cover in terms of, I, I see here, Art, you, you had something about organizing and protecting information, accessibility versus perfect protectionism. If you had any thoughts there and then Francis, you had uh, a, a point here that you wanted to take. So do you want to get through those and then we'll, we'll talk about tools. Yeah. I just wanted to throw out the one, one thought that, and it's a counterpoint to all this. This can be carried to an extreme where security winds up limiting the functionality and the capability of what you're able to do. You can't go through and send messages without having access to this. You can't uh, compress and send a file without having these particular security keys. And, and you can get to a point where productivity suffers because security goes too far. Now, anybody on the security side will say, well, security can never go too far. Yeah, uh, we all have to live in a world of compromise. This has to be one of those areas too. You may defer on the more secure side, but there's still going to be a point where you have to stop securing and actually start working. And I, I get challenged with that a lot of times in large corporations because you'll have entire teams whose job is to man the parapets and protect the walls of the castle. And I think that's a fantastic job for them to be doing, but they almost sometimes wind up in a myopic view of everything must defer to this. And there has to be a point of reasonable balance to say, yeah, we totally need to secure the walls, but are we preventing people from getting work done and take that into consideration? And that's where good leadership should be looking at this and taking everything into perspective and saying, okay, we have done our due diligence. We have done everything we can reasonably to be secure and still be productive. Yeah, I was just thinking about the fact that with every piece of encryption, 
we have to remember that there is a cost of time and energy to that. And so like thinking about little things, like for example, encrypting communications is very important and absolutely something that we need to do, right? And and I think this movement toward uh, whether it's ephemeral messaging as, as Francis is talking about, or if it's uh, end-to-end encryption in uh, you know text, audio, and video messaging uh, between individuals and groups, when we take something that is non-encrypted and then we encrypt it, we are actually adding more code to the data stream and therefore more server load more energy is being used and therefore there's actually an environmental cost to encrypting everything. So if we're, if we're creating more data energy consumption, we are then having a greater environmental impact. Now that's a cost we have to understand. We have to be able to do it and we have to be able to then remedy or kind of um, remediate the cost of doing that to the environment. But every one of these things has a trade-off. And no, no part here is independent of all other parts. So we have to do what we can do to be better at all of the cybersecurity practices so that we don't have to be susceptible to the productivity hits constantly. And I think that some of these cybersecurity practices actually can be done in such a way that help us be more productive. I really do. And, um, and so I, I think you're, you're spot on art, which is, you know, if everybody uh, needs to harden to the point of of being unproductive, you know, you might as well just disconnect from the internet completely, right? Just take all your devices offline and never connect to the internet again, and uh, and you know, lock yourself in your home and never open your door again, and the world will be great. <laughs> well, but but there is something to be said for the concept of air gapping. I mean, where you literally have stuff that's not on the net. Uh, there, that that is a reasonable approach. I mean, if you have highly sensitive content that you would feel better not being anywhere a flash drive on a machine that you turn off the internet for while you're working with it that gets pretty darn close and you pull the flash drive out before you connect back to the web i mean there's there's a lot that you can do and it may not be that unrealistic but again what's the cost who does it help who does it hurt at that point you have lost access to remote a- or lost capability for remote access, for collaboration, uh, for search capabilities, any number of things offered by cloud-based services. You're saying, I'm willing to give that up to have better, greater peace of mind that this information is protected. And that's not unreasonable, but it is a personal decision. No matter what security professionals will outline as these are the best practices. Totally agree with that, but you have to determine what are the right practices for you. And the miraculous part is that we're getting more capable of securing data while in transit and in use. Uh, Even Google Cloud now in in this past year's uh, next events, they were talking about the notion of being able to bring in-use encryption, basically, as their customer's data is being utilized on the database, it was still encrypted, which left no room for eyes on the data, but the user. Uh, So it's really remarkable that we're getting to that point where we'll actually be able to have encrypted data in use, uh, even on a cloud server environment. And uh, as, as opposed to just being, you know, encrypted at rest or encrypted in transit, we a really remarkable level of new technologies that are giving us these capabilities. But none of that, uh, you know, can stop, you know, either cold storage, air gapping, those kinds of things uh, in in certain highly secure environments. So I wanted to um, just pass it over to you, Francis. You had some thoughts, and then we'll move on to security tools and talk through those. I think you're referring to the the password cracking um, graphic. I just put I just noticed it the other day on the internet. But basically, they said the time it takes for a hacker to crack your password. I just thought it was uh, interesting background information. It's I put the link in the show notes. Um, essentially, it says that if you have the worst the worst kind of password to have is one that's short, has only numbers or lowercase letters, but then as you combine numbers, lowercase letters, uppercase letters, special characters and symbols, 
the time it takes for a hacker to get through the password and to figure it out goes up almost, it seems like exponentially. I don't know if you guys have seen these charts, but they're, they're a prompt to everyone out there that if you have a simple password that's not doesn't have the complexity it needs, then it, they can get through and hack it instantly as opposed to it being more complex and longer, in which case it could take 72 quadrillion years or seven quadrillion years according to the chart I'm looking at. There's definitely logic and structure to complexity versus ease of reading and things like that that come into play. Um, just as an example here, again, I don't shy away from it. I use LastPass. I have used it for years. Uh, one of the functions that they have is the ability to generate passwords. And what's interesting is, is when you go, and I'm sure other applications do it the same way. When you go in, you have the option to choose the password length. You have the option to use all possible characters, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and symbols, which some security policies will you will require. Uh, a lot of corporate environments will require you to have uppercase, lowercase numbers and a symbol, a non-alphanumeric symbol included in it. But LastPass includes you the option to have passwords that are, quote, easy to read and also easy to say. Now, I don't know how easy some of these are to say, but they look less like, you know, the computer threw up on your screen with random characters than they do, you know, actual phrases. But the trick is, is that this is going to generate a random sequence of characters that you can then copy and put into place. Are these rememberable? No, no shot. I would love to meet the person that can remember like 40 of these because I'm taking them to the casino. This stuff is designed to be difficult to remember and that's, and it's designed to use tools to store it, but you can use the tools to generate the secure connection or the secure passwords that you need to whatever level of parameter. I'll be honest. I'm not generating 40 word or 40 character passwords because I find so many systems like Ray mentioned earlier that don't accept that, that just cap out at 12 or 16 characters. Matter of fact, I, I found a financial one the other day that capped out at eight characters. I'm like, are you kidding? But anyway, that should be, that should be prosecutable. I mean, really governments should be prosecuting those, those financial institutions for that kind of, uh, it's, it's reckless, it's gross negligence and, uh, man, it just fires me up. Yeah. Well, don't, don't even get me started on the whole security question thing too. Cause that's, that's a whole, that's a whole different conversation. The tools are there to be able to generate that, whether you use an online tool or I know there's offline tools to be able to generate it. Or to be honest with you, you could just set it up if you really wanted to set it up in like Excel to generate something and spit out your passwords for you. The trick is, is that don't try and come up with your own. If you sit there and you try and come up with your own, it's going to be something that you're going to think, oh, I can remember this. And that's the first failing. If you're spending time trying to remember your passwords, you're asking for trouble. We don't need that anymore. Yeah, I just I was looking at some data from earlier this uh, this year. Uh, one out of every 142 passwords on the internet is one two three four five six, uh, and <laughs> and the the uh, number of passwords that are letters only are 30 percent of the internet, uh, lowercase only. 26% of the internet, 13.37% uh, 30, 30, uh, of the passwords are numbers only, and 34% of all passwords end with digits, and only 4.5% of them start with digits. So these are kinds of, you know, um, heuristics that we can use, obviously, to be able to generate stronger passwords that is using special characters having them longer uh, than 10 characters is obviously um, you know useful uh, you know all of these things help to increase uh, the entropy that would require someone to do more computing power which makes you less of a target and so we can all do this and honestly as augusto noted earlier we are all stronger when we are stronger together than when we presume that we're stronger than the next slowest guy or the next slowest woman we have to be very mindful of the fact that when when you're more protected you the listener who we're talking to right now when you're more protected you're actually helping to protect us because you're the one who's going to send me the spam email from some hacker you know when you get attacked and that's going to lead to 
you know, it's a Trojan horse, right? It's gonna it's gonna lead to me getting uh, my system infiltrated and um, and on and on and on, right? And so the the hope is to be able to to shore up everyone's security that makes us all more secure in the end and so i'm i'm very much about the idea that we're in this together you know we have to we have to fight back in every uh, possible uh, productive way we can and that makes us all more productive generally because we're not dealing with the security issues on an ongoing basis i wanted to talk about some of the tools we all use in securing our systems but also in dealing with you know we have not just uh, data security and privacy, but we also have the factor of being able to um, have tools that help us be more productive without having to actually do all the work. And so I just wanted to mention some of the tools that are out there that we can use that will really help us do that. And we've been heavy on the password managers. Uh, so I just wanted to make a, a note on that because there's kind of three classes of password management that we can really think of in in um, you know, in, in the consumer world uh, that we use. And uh, I think I heard, Art, did you say you use LastPass? Yeah, I use LastPass all the time. Yeah. And then Augusto's on 1Password. I'm on LastPass as well. Ultimately, it ends up being easier for me if everybody is on the system because then, you know, sharing passwords and uh, like, for example, LastPass has the function that, you know, should I pass away, uh, you know, giving access to, to my passwords to uh, my next you know, of kin is very easy in the system. Uh, and and so things of that nature make it really, really helpful, especially in this digital age where, you know, like my Google photos will disappear. My Facebook account will disappear if someone doesn't have access to those things. So it's really important to be able to have that kind of power. Uh, but just note, there are password managers uh, and there are probably four or five out there that are that are consistently well rated that stay up to date that I really uh, tend to recommend. And we've put those in show notes past. I, I can put them back in, in the show notes for this episode as well. But there are also security keys. These are these are physical devices. Um, some are actually phones. You can use your smartphone in some capacities as a security key as well, but they are literally physical keys, usually USB that you plug into the device and uh, secure, or they're Bluetooth connected. So you press a button and only when you are going to log in and it asks you, do you press the little button or or push it in and press the button physically to close the circuit and, and provide the uh, the password in, embedded on the device. And that allows the system to authenticate that it's you. There are also authenticator apps. And this is one of the best things you can do. If you go to twofactorauth.org, I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Uh, you can find out all the various services that allow for two-factor or multi-factor authentication. This allows you to be able to say to Google, for example, uh, when I go to log into my account, I want you to be able to look where I'm logging in from, my username and password, which are both basically passwords. One's a public key, one's a private key. So don't think about your public key as being something that you want to share widely anyway. Uh, you know, just like we don't want to share our email addresses, which is what your Google account uh, uses as a credential, you know, e either an email address or phone number. Usually, you want to you want to not tell everybody in the world uh, what your email address and password is. So publishing those on the public web is probably not the best thing. Anyway, but uh, multi-factor authentication is that point. It says where are you located, uh, what are, what's your public and private key, and in this authenticator app, we can provide either a time-based code or some other uh, entropy-based code that is provided at the time you're going to log in, you punch in that code, and then we'll log you in. And that's tied to a physical device. So it's either tied to a phone or a tablet or a computer. And this creates a greater level of security on top of it. So you have multiple forms of password and login credential access. I will also note there's a new technology out there called Squirrel, S-Q-R-L. And it is remarkably powerful and uh the progenitor of it is a is a podcast host and he's a he's a really um, smart guy steve gibson he coined the term spyware so uh so so steve gibson is uh is just a is just a great guy anyway but anyway um so so i think that we we need to be uh, mindful of the fact that not every type of um secure system requires a password um, many times there are systems that allow you to use single sign-on. So for example, many of the services that I use, if it allows me to log in using Google, which I have locked down, you know, it's it's got 
uh, multi-factor authentication turned on. Uh, and so I have a physical security key for both of my Google accounts, my work Google account and my personal Google account. So I have to plug that device into the computer press the button, and that's the only way anyone's going to be allowed into my system. So when I log into other services using my Google account, I feel much more comfortable never setting a password for those systems and just logging in through Google. That gives me that extra level of security that if that system's compromised, it doesn't matter because they're never going to be able to log in to the system uh, you know, through me. They're, you know, they're not going to get in as me. They're only going to ever be able to get in through the server side and hack into the uh, developer situation. So I don't really care. You know, that's not that's not within my power, you know, so I'm not going to really worry about that. So what are some other tools that you all use? Well, I definitely use the software-based authenticators. Uh, I think in some cases it's necessary if you switch to a two-factor authentication model. Uh, that's probably the biggest thing. I have to admit I do use air-gapped USB drives. In many cases, if I have something that, for example, I want to store archivally, uh, has no reason to be parked out on the cloud, I have no reason to access it remotely, I will air gap it, put it on a USB drive and drop it into a lockbox. That way I know I can get to it. I have access and nobody else does because they can't get to the physical device. Besides that, I don't use too many other things. I've looked at the YubiKey and the other tools like that. I like the principle. I don't have any direct need for that right now, uh, but I, I want to revisit something real quick that you mentioned earlier, Ray. The accessibility to your information after you're no longer accessible, after you've, for some reason, can't do it, is really way more important than I think people give it credit. I mean, just thinking about dealing with things like how do you get into you know, bank accounts and, and utility accounts to pay the bills and have access to, like you said, photos or documents or anything like that that's stored and protected now. If you're not available, that stuff might as well just be deleted if there's no way for the right people after you to be able to access it. Tools like LastPass have that ability to give you that. But if you do something just just as simple as taking, you know, your master system password, writing it on an index card, sealing it in an envelope, putting it in a secure place and keeping that up to date so that if something happens to you, your loved ones can get into what they need to get into. That's a huge step. If you don't do that, honestly, if you've ever had to deal with a situation where you couldn't get into things, it's really a nightmare. It really is. When we think about security, often we think about work information. What about all my personal stuff when I think about specifically like financial documents and old tax forms and I'm converting paper into imagery. How do I protect all that stuff? Yeah. So that ends up being using and utilizing encrypted folders and or encrypted note-taking technologies and sticking to those kinds of, of localized environments where you can go ahead and encrypt them. Now, again, there's going to always be a trade-off here because you're not going to be able to have your documents OCR'd and searchable if you're, if you're encrypting these kinds of things. In olden days, which still technically works, you can zip those and password protect the zip files. And so, you know, every year at the end of, say, the tax year, you go ahead and file your returns you put everything into a folder and you go ahead and uh, just zip the folder and, you know, uh, open source software like 7-Zip gives you the ability to go ahead and password protect the zip file. And that will go ahead and uh, password protect it for you. You can, of course, uh, encrypt most Office files. So you could just go into the Word document or Excel file or, or whatnot and say, I want to password protect this. Same thing with Adobe PDF you can go ahead and, and say, I want to I want to password protect these documents. And again, you're, you're saving those passwords to your password manager so that you're not losing access to the device, uh, to the document uh, by virtue of not remembering the password. Uh, but you're going to have to do some level of encryption before you put it in the note-taking software, or you're going to have to encrypt the software in there. Now, there are certain open source uh, tools that allow you to be able to, uh, in essence, uh, put the data in a localized environment like Joplin or otherwise. And uh, I, I think Joplin, yeah, I think Joplin is a localized service. You can keep everything local. Um, and, you know, you, you then have the ability to 
put that database in a secure location, one that can't be attacked by ransomware by putting it into, in the Windows 10 world, you're putting it into a protected uh, uh, folder so that you know it can't be modified um, outside your system without you giving it permission to. And, or on the Mac, you're uh, basically doing time machine backups and making sure that you're getting those backups uh, off your system in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so I have in the Mac, I have the I have a thumb drive. That thumb drive gets backed up every so often, and then I swap out the the drives. So I'm I'm in essence always on a rolling cycle of having the backups being done to a device. I pop out the 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 drive that's being backed up, and then I'm putting another one on there. And that way, those databases are being backed up on there as well. And should I be hit with ransomware for some reason on the Mac, then I can go back and say, okay, well, here goes the drive that I had the data on last and go ahead and restore from there. So we want to be kind of mindful of those things. Um, and, uh, and, and certainly, I think you can, you can easily do those um, today with local note-taking software uh, that allow you to be able to store documents inside of it. And that's probably the easiest way to do it today. Some, some other things that I just wanted to cover really, really quickly, and that is a product called Firewalla. Uh, Firewalla is a physical device that you connect to your networks. And I recommend this for both homes and businesses. In essence, we're now in this situation where we're probably going to have more people working from home than ever before and remote working more than ever before. And the great part about Firewalla is that it's a small device that you can plug into any network, whether or not you say, you know, are home or you have an Airbnb, you just plug this little device in, and it, in essence, creates multiple layers of security for you. So one, as its name implies, Firewalla is a firewall, but it's so much more than that because it is actively monitoring the network based on all of the things that are happening within its own network, and it gives you activity and parental control. It's a VPN, uh, so basically it's a built-in VPN within the system, so even if you happen to be on a, a public a Wi-Fi network, your devices that are connected are, in essence, VPNing through the system so that you can protect yourself on the road, uh, wherever you might be uh, connected to public Wi-Fi. It does ad blocking. It gives you controls over um, children's time so that you know you can block kids from having too much time on the internet, that kind of thing. Uh, but there are different versions of the tool. There's an app associated with it, and there are more. Uh, there's a more rugged version for you know, businesses and that kind of thing, but they're really affordable for what they do. But as kind of a, kind of as a baseline, if you're just using, you know, the stock AT&T or stock Verizon or, or whatever Fios router that, that your uh, internet provider is, has provided to you, then you need Firewalla. Uh, also note that if you have something like Google Wi-Fi or an Eero network or a higher end network, many of those will have firewalls built into them. And so just make sure that they're staying up to date and updating on a regular basis and what kind of firewall they're actually implementing. And uh, you basically turn it up to the highest and see what it breaks. And then you kind of edge it backwards until uh, the things that you need to be operating are operating uh, properly. You've talked about this before, Art. Can you explain to people what privacy.com is and how it works? Ah, that's one of my favorite web applications. I Me love too. This thing. I love privacy.com and they're not even sponsoring this. So, but they really should. Um, privacy.com, what it does is it allows you to create basically disposable debit cards. Uh, if you think about it this way, every time you purchase something online, you're going to have to do some sort of a transaction. A lot of times you'll use things like Google Pay or you'll use uh, PayPal or something like that, but some places won't take those. So privacy.com allows you to go in, you set up an account, and it provides a secured layer between the merchant that you're dealing with and your financial institution. Now, the trick with this is places like PayPal and, and Google Pay, they manage the transaction. Well, what privacy.com allows you to do is to generate a unique, literally like visa number to deal with that vendor. And you can assign it to that vendor and say, look, anything for that account has to go through this visa number. 
you can then say that this visa number or this MasterCard number, whatever it spits out to you, is capped at maybe a maximum purchase of $250 or $100 or maybe no more than $15 a month. I do this all the time for subscription services. If I sign up for a subscription, I use a privacy.com transaction or account number and then say, I'm going to cap it just a little bit higher than the subscription amount. I know they can't overcharge me. I know they can't raise their rates on me surprisingly uh, because it'll just bounce back. And if I should ever get into a situation where I want to cancel that service and it happens to be a company that's winding up being difficult, I can just go in and turn off that card. I can make the card go away and then the transactions don't process through. It's, they are, like I said, they're encrypted, they're secured, they're separated, they're trackable. Um, It is a wonderful thing, especially if you do any sort of extensive online purchasing or accounts or services, you should look at something like privacy.com. And I recommend specifically privacy.com to get that stuff secured and protected. Combine that with your password system and you're in pretty good shape. Yeah. And while, while you're talking about passwords to solve the problem that Francis was talking about before, where you have some random person who you're just trying to send a one-time uh, secret to all the, all the various tools, last pass, one pass, you know, password and others have the function to be able to share a, an entry, an item with others. And so what you could do is basically use LastPass generate the code or if you have the code outside of the system place the code into to LastPass and then just plug the email address into the share functionality to the individual who with whom you want to share that that secret with they will then be required to set up the pass password account you know with that system and once they're in they will be able to then access the secret whatever that is the password identifying code what have you and then be allowed to uh, utilize it so that would be the way that, you know, if you want to kind of reduce the entry level, you're in essence telling them to utilize the tool you're using so that you're capable of, of sharing that secret. It may, it may reduce the, the overhead just a little bit on, on that level. So that was my only thought in terms of um, these kinds of ephemeral messages that you want to then be able to delete from the system. Uh, I, I don't know any ephemeral messaging platforms that are are going to require no account. It's just, I think it's going to be ultimately, um, you know, more difficult than not. Um, I did want, before we closed out, to talk a little bit about some of these monitoring tools. And they are across a whole class of of tools. And I, I don't have time to explain all of them here, but I want to kind of cover some of them. So if you want to see whether or not your passwords have been compromised or other accounts across the internet have been compromised, I'll put a link to a few services that do that, including Google Chrome itself. Google Chrome has the the, power to, in essence, analyze the usernames and passwords you have inside of your browser and to tell you whether or not that is a problem. So does Firefox. Uh, If you uh, have this vague notion that you are protected on the internet uh, there is a tool called Shodan, and Shodan is uh, is is kind of the opposite of uh, in in terms of its ability to look at internet connected devices. In essence, it can search across the entire internet and see devices that may, of course, be uh, culpable to an attack. But they have something called Shodan Monitor, and this is you actually self identifying in the system so that you can see what kinds of uh, security vulnerabilities you have on your system and on your devices uh, by being connected to the internet. So Shodan Monitor is really great. And there's a business level one called Spies. And this actually looks at your website. Uh, It looks at anything that in essence has a a, a domain name, a a, web address or an IP address or IPv4, IPv6. And uh, it could just search across all of these various uh, addresses and uh, uh, cull the information necessary to be identify to identify is that SSL certificate uh, valid? Is it is it really actually uh, properly secure? Is it using the right encryption keys? Those kinds of things that I think are really really powerful. So I'll put links to all of these in the show notes so you guys can um, access those and to a list of some encrypted note taking software and encrypted me- encrypted messaging apps as we talked about earlier like Threema and Signal and so on and so forth um, and. Final thoughts, gentlemen, before we close out. 
any final burning thoughts about cybersecurity? Wonderful. Well, thank you everybody for your thoughts and I really want to impress upon listeners the importance of thinking about your current cybersecurity, your current cyber resilience practices, both in your home and family, extended family, you know, that particular aunt or uncle who might be just a little bit older and is not particularly paying attention to things and is very susceptible to all kinds of fraud, you know, across the board. And then, of course, uh, your professional uh, protection. Uh, your productivity is dependent upon technology in so many ways today. And so the more protected you are, the more likely you are to uh, be able to to uh, withstand, be resilient to attacks that are happening by the hour throughout uh, the day. So with that, if you have a question or a comment you would like to share, if you have a, have a particular cybersecurity tool that you love using and you want to share it with us, you can feel free to do that by commenting or asking a question directly on the episode page on productivitycast.net. Go ahead and find uh, the episode, and at the bottom of the page, you can go ahead and, and leave your messages uh, so that we can read and respond to them. If you are on the episode page, you'll also find a our show notes. So like all the tools that we talked about today, all the uh, things that we talked about are all there linked out there so you can get to them. And that also comes with a text transcript of our episode as well as a PDF transcript. It's machine transcripted, so it's not, you know, highly accurate, but it, it is good enough for you to be able to jump to sections and know what we're talking about. And if you have a topic you'd like us to cover in a future personal productivity uh, discussion, feel free to uh, go to productivitycast.net forward slash contact. You can leave a voice recorded message, or you can actually uh, click the keys or tap your screen and type a message out and uh, send that along to us. And so we always appreciate your messages. Uh, I want to express my thanks to Augusto Pinaud, Francis Wade, and Art Gelwicks for joining me here on Productivity Cast this and every week. Uh, you can learn more about them and their work by visiting productivitycast.net and clicking on the About page and learn all about them. Uh, I'm Ray Sidney Smith, and on behalf of all of us here at Productivity Cast, here's to your productive life. That's it for this Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things productivity, with your hosts, Ray Sidney Smith and Augusto Pinaud, with Francis Wade and Art Gelwicks.